Thank you so much for the welcome. Thank you for a, a wonderful, well, demonstration of dancing last night. Wasn't it absolutely fantastic? What we're going to cover over the next 45 minutes is the results from this year's uh, survey of you and your peers. So firstly, I'd like to start off by thanking you for contributing to this research. For those of you who uh, filled in our survey forms and talked to us about what was actually happening in your world, because of course, without your generosity and your time, we would have nothing to talk about on stage this morning. Now, why would you be interested in what we're going to cover today? And I think there's really three groups of people and three reasons that this is hopefully helpful to you. Now, if you're a CIO or a technology leader, it gives you a chance to see what your peer group says matters to them. It either confirms the direction that you're taking or perhaps says, well, maybe it challenges the direction that you're taking. So hopefully, you'll be able to confirm or challenge your own thoughts about what's going to happen over the next year. Because this is really aimed at 2023, it's sort of a near-term future. If you work for a CIO, it's always good to know what your boss is thinking and the priorities that your boss may have or the changes that may come as a result of those priorities. And if you're a vendor, it's always good to know the mind of your customer. So hopefully, whoever you are, you'll get something out of this next 45 minutes. Because really what I want to do is start with a challenge that many of us face and it's the what are we going to tell the board challenge. We know digital is important. We know that the future of many corporations has an enormous digital element in it. But we also know that many of those digital programs are not delivering anything like the outcomes that we hoped for them, are not delivering in anything like the speed that we hoped they would be delivering. In. in other words, we have a value problem and we have a speed problem. So when the board says, tell me about this digital dividend that you have been promising us for the last, well, in some cases, 10 years, but for most of us, the last three or four years, what are we going to tell the board? Because when you start looking at the numbers, the numbers are fairly clear. Um, could you advance to my next slide, please, and could I have a new clicker? When we start looking at this, the, the actual data which underpins the, um, the numbers of what the board is actually investing in, this next chart, can I have my next chart, please? If this next chart comes up, what we will see is, a, is, a, is a basically a change in the investment patterns over the, the next few years. So if you, if you can do the builds for me, Oh, excuse me a second, we have a slight technical issue. If I can bend down after my poly Bollywood dancing. There we go, thank you. All right, lovely. So look, what we have here is some time series data of the last few years. This is what your executive tell us that they're investing in. And as you can see, these, you know, go back to 18 to 22. And what we have here is a number of patterns of investment. And one of the biggest things that's being invested in, the new thing that's being invested in, is this thing called digital capabilities. So there's an expectation amongst the promoters, the owners, the boards of directors, that we are going to get some sort of return on this investment. Now, looking at this data, you go, OK, that's interesting. So there's been some money put behind digital. When we start looking at CIO uh, budget expectations, these are the global data. And looking at these numbers, they look pretty darn healthy. They're much bigger than last year. So we have a typical number from globally at about 5.1% growth on last year, which is a substantial increase at a faster rate than in previous years. And when you start looking at this is where I have to start tap dancing on the data because we have the mostly Indian data, but my statisticians told me I couldn't just use the India data because it wasn't quite big enough. So I've kind of brought in a few extra countries which are similar. And so what we're looking at here is that your budget increases are much more modest, about 3.3%. But wait, there's more. Because when you overlay inflation, which is what these data are, what it means is, with a very few exceptions, we're actually seeing budget decreases in real terms. Now, the India data, I shall pull it out because I got it this morning from the OECD, inflation is 6.7% here, so it's even worse. And that is CPI. That is not 
the labor rate inflation for AI specialists, for Microsoft Dynamics specialists, for ERP specialists, for network specialists, for developers of any sort, which the salaries are going up much more quickly than inflation. Okay, so there's a big expectation about digital. Yes, the boards of directors are putting more money into digital. They've been doing it for years, and they're beginning to ask, where's the dividends? And now we have a problem that, yes, we have more money, but in real terms, those numbers are actually shrinking. Okay. Well, is there some good news? No. Because most digital, what you tell us is most of your digital, most of you have digital initiatives that are late. Most of you have digital, digital initiatives that are not delivering the value we hoped they would deliver. So what are we going to tell the boards, the promoters, the people who've been investing in digital? How do we deliver those digital dividends? Now, what you tell us is, don't worry, there is hope, because there's some things that we can do. And the things that, we can, you, that you tell us that you're going to do, and maybe you could consider building into your agenda for next year, is these three things. And these are something we're going to drill down on over the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Problem number one is we can't really agree amongst the senior leadership what digital actually is. So step one is trying to get some sort of consensus. And we have a, a couple of suggestions as to how you might do that. Problem number two is, do we have to do this all of ourselves? Because there's a talent shortage. There's a talent inflationary problem. Maybe there's another way of unlocking some of the digital and technical capabilities in our enterprise. And the answer is there is. And we'll talk about fusion teams, and we'll talk about business technologists as a way of magnifying or amplifying the experiences and skills that your IT talent has got. And then finally, where do we get our talent from? Maybe there are some more sources of talent that we might tap into. Now, that would, might represent changing the risk profile of some of this talent, but maybe there is a source or sources of untapped talent that we might be able to use. So they're the three solutions to this, how do we make digital go faster? And the first of those we're going to talk about is, well, what exactly is this digital thing anyway? Now, when we asked your peer group, why were you investing in digital? What was it that was basically put into the business case for digital? We got this answer. We said, well, there's some above-the-line things. There's growth. There's uh, new products and services. There's improving the citizen or the customer experience. And that's all good stuff. But what we also saw was there's been a sea change. There's been a change of emphasis in digital quite subtly, but quite recently, where we're now seeing digital as a primary driver of productivity. So in other words, digital has switched from being a cost of goods sold issue, new product, to an SG&A expense because we're trying to reduce operating expenses of our business. Most of you, over half, are improving the operational efficiencies of your enterprise. OK, so far so good. What happens when you ask your executive team why we are investing in digital? And you get a variety of answers. What this chart shows you is a response to that very question. We asked uh, a series of chief marketing officers, chief financial officers, chief operating officers, and so on. You can see the list down the board. What was it that we were hoping to get from our digital programs? And what we got was an enormous variety of answers from, yes, money saving to growth to all of those other things. Um, chief strategy officers, digital will help us with mergers and acquisitions integration. Interesting idea. Um, the, uh, if you're in, you ask your head of HR, digital will help us achieve uh, uh, higher talent. That is true. But the problem with this is we can't do all of this all at the same time. There is another problem. When we talk to the chief executive, about, well, tell me, what do you expect your chief information officer, your, your head of technology to do? The answer is one word, digital. Okay, how successful have we been 
in at least getting some sort of consensus as to what digital means. How many of us have been successful in at least agreeing what we're trying to do with digital? The answer is, mostly, we haven't. A very small minority of you have managed to get a, a meaningful and useful consensus as to what digital is trying to achieve in our enterprise. Most of us have not. So if you're in the 93% of people who have not really got that joined up view of what digital is, and it varies by business and it varies by function, you're in good company. How might we address this issue? Well, there's a couple of things that seem to work, which you tell us work for you anyway. The first thing is listening out for those signals. You get stories, you get snippets, you get language, you get direction and focus from your senior leadership team. And sometimes the notion of taking that wording and taking those stories and playing them back helps build consensus as to what it is that we're really trying to do with digital. Now, there's a whole raft of things we can do, but let's get a, a prioritized sequence of things based on, essentially, their language. The other important input here is market, or if you're a public sector business, what the politicians and what the mission, uh, the, the uh, con constituents that your mission is aimed at, what that group is telling us matters too. What is the market telling us in terms of digital? Is this a story of efficiency or is this a story of new products? Is this a story of extending capability or improving the quality of the work that we do already or a combination of all of those things? So what is the market telling us? Because that's giving us permission to focus the story that we're trying to get digital to tell on a more achievable set of objectives. And finally, your best partner signals. Now, most of us have got a wide variety of stakeholders. Some of those stakeholders, let us say, are antagonistic towards us and are antagonistic towards digital. But other stakeholders are actually enthusiastic. They might be enthusiastic adopters of something. They might be enthusiastic advocates of change. Now, this raises a very interesting question, by the way, about how do we bring about organizational change, particularly related to the work that digital needs to change? Here's the sort of rhetorical question. I'm thinking, who should I bring into my advisory for this digital program? Should I bring the old guys, like me, who've been doing something for a long time, and I'm likely to be set in my ways, but I have influence, or do I go out and bring in the young people who will be welcoming of new ideas and will embrace the change and be enthusiastic supporters of it? The answer, if you can get some old guys and gals who've got great political presence, who've got great networks, but can also be persuaded, those people are absolutely golden to have part of the digital steering committee or the digital program. The young guys and gals are fantastic, but they need that top cover too. So the golden outcome is those old curmudgeons like me, if you can persuade me to support your program, because that will open up the opportunity of political influence and networks. Then, where they overlap gives you a chance to focus that vision thing onto something where you can make a difference something else you can do, because that's really storytelling. How about the CFO? How about people who are generally more numerate, more logical rather than story-oriented? Well, here's an idea. You start with what we're trying to achieve digitally, right at the bottom, some activities, and they build up to what those activities deliver, and they in turn build up to what those activities are trying to deliver, and they build up to some golden outcome. This is a banking example, but you could easily use it for your own industry. And what we're trying to do here is create an audit trail, a plausible linkage between what we do digitally at the bottom and some beneficial 
business outcome at the top. We're trying to, if you like, tell a consistent, coherent metrics story. But you don't have to take my word for this, because one of the things I'd like to share with you this morning is a, an interview we did for the work that you're about to see, which is from um, Johnson & Johnson. Suli Lee is a regional CIO for Johnson & Johnson Vision. Um, Suli will introduce herself and tell you a little bit about Johnson & Johnson Vision. But listen out for how she uses metrics, how she uses storytelling, and how she builds consensus about what digital is for Johnson & Johnson Vision. If you could run my video, please. My name is Suli. I'm the business technology leader for Johnson & Johnson Vision Asia Pack. I'm based out of Singapore. We manufacture vision medical devices. For us, it's about how do we serve our patients and our community better. Being a credo-based company, we want to help people to see better, connect better, and live better. We leverage technology to actually have better outreach to the communities and help our patients to understand sight is very important and how do we preserve it and restore our sight. Before COVID, you know, the way we function will be, I, I, I believe that we were still a little bit traditional in the way that marketing team will be working with agency, looking at creative content, pushing that through commercials, whether it's YouTube or social media, and then understanding how many impressions they've gotten. IT will then say, I have pushed a application into the patient hand and be able to click it through. And then the COMEX team will be rewarded on the incentive scheme of how many products they were able to sell to the store. As you can see, everybody have their own metrics. And this doesn't allow to say, hey, how many patients have you served? Did your impression actually help to create the awareness in the market? What about looking at you know, whether people are really clicking through and spending time with the content and therefore helping our sales rep to actually um, have better and differentiated conversation with the eye care professionals. Always come prepared to the meeting. And what do I mean by that? That I need to always bring something with me to help people to visualize where are we going? How are we going to get there? And showing them example, and that's why I always come with either a number or a picture or a use case to the boardroom. And I think that's a very powerful thing to do if people want to drive change meaningfully. The way I kind of navigate through this is actually having those conversations together and asking those questions and helping people to come together on this journey and showing people what good looks like. And it's really about encouraging people to bring out their confidence to speak up, to share, having those two ways dialogue, and finally actually putting a stretch goal that we feel that we can achieve together. So one of the things that we've done, we actually hosted a hackathon as a tool for us to break down the silos of working and actually drive more focus around the patient's voice. Now the hackathon, the judges that I've selected was actually from different department and different function. It really helped us to focus only on one goal, and that is to how do we help our patient to restore and preserve their sight better? And what was their problem? How can we help them to solve this problem? And that was such a powerful um, crowdsourcing moment. When we went back to the boardroom, we were all excited. We were feeling on the energy. We were so clear in terms of our vision and our mission, and why do we come together as a cross-functional team, and what is that purpose? And the conversation was free and easy after that. Your goals and your matrices need to be aligned against those goals. Let me give you one example. If patients are the people you are serving, then you need to know how many lives, how many patients, how many sites you are touching. That should be your highest goals or higher metrics. And the functional goals should actually build out to be a leading indicators that will show how you can achieve this. I do believe that CIO is not just driving the technology stack and has no skin in the game in terms of driving the business outcomes. In, if that is the case, we need to make sure that those functional goals actually do merge and we look at our strategy, we understand our vision. I think we should really understand 
how we can shape savings, how we can shape better impression that the marketing team is trying to build and be able to actually walk the talk of true business leaders. combination of storytelling, a combination of metrics, a way of bringing multidisciplinary teams, and what Suli didn't talk about is some of the people who are in the judging were, let's say, less enthusiastic about digital than some of the other people who are in her judging panels. So what we've just heard there is one of your peers, uh, based in Singapore, Suli talking about how she can combine storytelling with metrics with judicious use of influence to get a much greater consensus, to get a much greater vision of what, in that case, Johnson & Johnson vision is trying to do with digital. Because that addresses one of the problems that we've just highlighted, which is there's very little consensus, or there's potentially very little consensus to what digital is, and therefore what we should be trying to do with it. So, Part one, or act one of this three-act play that we're, we're presenting to you this morning is to say, well, how do we build that consensus? And we can build that consensus by really thinking about orchestrating that CXO community around a, a clearer set of objectives. And in the case of Johnson & Johnson Vision, it was aimed very, very squarely at the, the patient. In your context, it may be aimed at the citizen or the customer or some other purpose. But getting that clarity and that consensus on that clarity is achievable with a combination of storytelling, metrics, and you know, judicious stakeholder engagement. Okay, so we are now getting at least a clearer view of where we should be driving digital and perhaps even what digital is. Because if you ask your executive peers, there may be eight or ten of them sitting around the executive committee table, they will all have a slightly different view. Well, hopefully what you've just heard Su Lee talk about will help you at least corral those views into something more consistent. So the next question is, hmm, great, okay, how do I amplify the limited talent that I have in my own IT organization to be able to deliver some of these programs or some of the change that digital requires me to deliver? And we'll talk a bit about really two things here. The notion of the business technologist, that is to say the, the IT expert, but is not that person, but is not necessarily on the payroll of the IT organization. They don't necessarily report to you, but nevertheless, they're a very useful uh, commodity, if that's the wrong word, a very useful resource that we can tap into. The other grouping or the other organizational construct is this notion of a fusion team. Uh, like an agile group, but kind of more so. So let's, let's take a look at that. When we ask, again, senior leaders about who should ultimately be accountable for digitization or who should ultimately account about building the tools for digitalization, what we see is a very interesting statistic. Nearly 67% well, of the chief executives that we surveyed for this piece of work said, actually, CEOs want their senior executives, their business executives, to be much more involved and maybe even more responsible for delivering those digital capabilities, whether that's a customer portal or a new supply chain. So yes, the IT organization is in there, but they want the accountability to rest with their senior leadership team. The other question is, okay, if you ask that same senior leadership team who should be really providing these digital capabilities for me, the answer again is quite an interesting answer because nearly three quarters, 73%, said actually we want our own people to be much more involved and more capable of delivering these outcomes than we have at present. So how can we achieve that? When we ask your peers, you, who's delivering most capabilities, it's still dependent mostly on your own people. So what we have here is a chart which, and these are just a sample of four types of technology. This list goes on and on, but the pattern is the same. Mostly, we're still dependent upon our internal IT organization for many of these capabilities. So that's that agile management, the whole agile environment, through to um, innovative and creative tools, whatever that might be. That might be a design tool, it might be an AI tool. Use of workforce digital multipliers, uh, knowledge management engines, collaboration engines. Again, IT 
folks are hugely involved in these things, but there is some hope, if you like, in that the numbers suggest that increasingly those business units are becoming more and more self-sufficient. Shared incentives for digital results. Again, things are improving. We are beginning to move responsibility from ourselves to our business colleagues, which is a good thing. It is a good thing because ultimately they will change because there's some skin in the game. It also is a good thing because it helps us amplify the reach and range of the services that we can provide. Because the IT organization focuses primarily on the areas where we can add most value and enabling your business colleagues, your technology executives to use those tools to seize the moment, to do things for themselves, to amplify the reach and range of the services they can deliver. What does this look like? Things like low-code, no-code solutions, it, sets of advice on security, privacy, compliance, all of those things. So how do we embrace this? Well, many of us are already, to a degree, embracing this notion of devolving responsibility. You think about the things that we're currently doing. We're providing low-code, no-code tools. We're providing a talent marketplace in some cases where you can find someone who's a, a Microsoft Dynamics expert or an AI expert. Communities of practice where you're getting groups of people together, say, to work on a user interface or the anthropology of human behavior. Um, ad hoc help. I'm trying to build something, what should I do? Training. We're already providing those services, or many of us are providing those services out into our, to our broader business community. But how do we slide this thing to the right? How do we make it so that we have a more direct contribution? Direct participation in a fusion team, a fusion team being a subject matter expert, developers. I'll give you an example from a bank. If you're putting a fusion team together for a banking product, typically you have marketing people to understand the market. Typically you have developers who know how to code. But you also have security people. You also have compliance people. Often you have digital ethicists. Often you have economists. Often you have anthropologists who understand human behavior in that team. So this fusion team is a fusion of business, subject matter experts, and technology groups together into one place. Put, put a product manager on top of that, and it becomes a digital product. We can play a much greater role in supporting that digital product than has historically been the case. So we can standardize parts of digital delivery, our APIs, our microservices. We can do rotations. We can take some of their more capable digital experts into our own ranks and take some of our more capable people and put them into the ranks of a digital practice. We can exchange, rotate people through business uh, uh, functions. And finally, we can start plugging into external talent ecosystems. Who is available? How can I bring them in? How can we tap into them? One of the groups that's very interesting for us, uh, that is to say, for us in the IT industry trying to amplify the reach and range of what we do, is this notion of the business technologist. Most organizations, most of your departments outside of IT have business technologists in them. Whether that person works in supply chain and is an expert in supply chain logistics and analytics, whether that person works in marketing and is an expert in sentiment analysis, whether that person works in product development and is an expert in building prototype products, whether that person and so on, you get the story. Now, each of those groups of people have got an expertise which is essentially an IT skill that we can tap into. How do we harness that capability? How do we equip those people to start building digital products? And the answer is things like no code, no code, training, and all of those things we've talked about. So the step number one is identifying these people. Step number two is putting them into some sort of talent marketplace so we can tap into them. Then 
we start creating these things called fusion teams. Now, a fusion team has got typically a product owner. Now, what, what's a product owner? Supposing we are a bank, and we are going to build a new digital offer, a new app for our smartphones. And we're going to offer that smartphone app to small and medium enterprise CFOs so they can control their cash balances. Somebody needs to be ultimately accountable for the digital success, or sorry, the economic success of that new product. And into that team, you have people who are experts in the product, understanding cash management, understanding CFOs. We put in, as I said, security people and anthropologists and all of those other people. But we also put in the developers. We also put in our own talent. We also rotate our own teams through those fusion teams to create essentially a separate business, a separate unit, which is focused on delivering that digital product. But it doesn't end there, because the real power of this is what happens next. Because those teams depend critically on a digital infrastructure. Think of it as APIs. Think of it as microservices. Think of it as, how do I equip that team to prototype quickly? How do I equip that team to prototype while staying within the constraints of our architecture? And the answer is, through the judicious supply of platforms, through the judicious supply of infrastructure, and through the judicious supply of, think of it as building the foundation for those fusion teams. And there's an interrelationship between the two. The fusion teams need to be expert in the use of the platforms, and the platform teams need to be acutely aware of what those fusion teams are trying to achieve, because ultimately, both are codependent upon the other. And it's that linkage that seems to distinguish the successful businesses that do this well from everybody else. If you want to run fusion teams at scale, it's that linkage that seems to be the differentiator. People who haven't made that linkage essentially are still struggling to make fusion teams work. So the second act to this three-act play talks about how we might amplify and access the experience, the digital capabilities that already exist in our enterprise, but outside of the conventional IT organization. The fusion team and the business technologist seems to be a solution which is working for your peers and maybe working for you already. But the secret source is linking that construct, that organizational construct, to the infrastructure, the platforms, the purchasing relationships, the technologies which underpin it, the digital foundation for those teams. That seems to be how to make this work at scale. The third and final act is a question about resources. Now, if you look at a typical uh, organization where you get your talent from, most of us say, well, you know, we hire it at university, or we hire it from our competitors, or we hire it from uh, contract agencies, and so on. And that's a fairly conventional source of talent. But another way of looking at it is, let's cast the net wider. Let's think about students. Let's think about gig workers. Let's think about buying startups or dealing with startups. Let's think about the digital disruptors, the Amazons or the Alibabas of this world. Let's think about this entire broader definition of where we might source talent from. And the interesting thing is, the numbers are very low. If you sort of look at it the other way, you could say, well, look, isn't this the opportunity? If 11% of us are using students, there's 89% who aren't. Could you use more students? Gig workers. 28% of you are using gig workers. That means 72% are not. Could you use gig workers? Could you use citizen developers? Could you use more startups than you do now? There's all sorts of interesting things in terms of mergers and acquisitions. You can acquire small businesses to access talent, what's called acqui-hiring, <laughs> which sounds like a pool maintenance company to me. You can look up things like, oh, I don't know, working more with the digital disruptors. Nearly half of you are, 48%, but how about the other 52%? 
Maybe by taking more risks in terms of your sourcing, you might be able to tap into broader resource pools than you're currently able to do so. OK, how about technology investments? Here's our old favorite slide. Everybody loves this slide. We use it every year, which is why it's back again this year. This is what your peer group are investing in. It's, it simply asks, it, it presents two data points. The dark blue data point is where your peer group and you are cutting investment, and the light blue is where you and your peer group are increasing investment, and it looks like this. Now, the interesting thing for me is cybersecurity is number two in your list. Almost everywhere else on the planet, it's number one. Nevertheless, most of you, are certainly a majority of you, are increasing investment in cybersecurity, in BI, and all of those things. The interesting thing for me is about a quarter of you are also actually reducing uh, investments, but only in a very limited sense, things like our legacy applications. The other more interesting thing for me is nearly a quarter of you are not trying to cut money anywhere. Can I just remind you of something we saw earlier? There's a big expectation on digital, and your budgets are actually shrinking in real terms. So a thought is, is there somewhere we can reallocate resources? Can we take money from something that we're already doing that maybe is not quite as important as it used to be to make way for some of the more important digital investments? Because a quarter of you have said, well, actually, we're not reducing expenditure anywhere. Eh, maybe, but maybe we should have another look at that. What else we got? Well, supposing we were trying to pivot Supposing we did an assessment, supposing we were, could do a greenfield site, what would your business peer group ask for? Well, we asked them, um, and this is what we got. A, a quite an interesting and eclectic list of things that you could potentially invest in. But there's some interesting things on this list. In a world of high inflation, one of the hardest things to do is price. You price too high, and you lose sales volume. You price too low, and you essentially give away margin. So pricing is really difficult. So when we look at this list, we do things like pricing optimization, which has become incredibly important in a high inflation environment. Supplier collaboration and performance management has become incredibly important with the supply chain issues. Advanced forecasting and inventory application uh, has become incredibly important in a high interest rate environment since working capital absorbs business resources. So if we were to take a, a green field view, a, a blank sheet of paper view, what would the priorities of your enterprise be? Maybe some of these would appear, maybe other more important and pressing things would appear. How do we make room for these investments? A suggestion is to revisit that previous list. In other words, go and kick the tires to see if we still need to do all of those things. Which brings us to the sort of conclusion of Act 3, if you like. Given all of these alternative sources of talent, students, gig workers, and so on, maybe we can take more of a risk in sourcing talent from some of these unconventional locations. Maybe we can deploy that talent in some unconventional places. Sales analytics, pricing, supply chain. Because they seem to be the new pressing areas in a world of high inflation, supply chain problems, and even talent shortages. So let's come back to where we started. There was a th there's a three-act play here. How do we make digital work better? How do we deliver it more quickly? How do we deliver it so that it creates better value? And there seem to be three things that your peer group is telling us that they're doing that seems to be working. Thing number one is getting consensus as to what exactly digital is. And you heard from Su Lee, and you heard from me, say there's really a couple of things you can do. Partly storytelling, 
partly metrics, partly focusing on that vision thing to get consensus as to what digital actually is and the direction that we need to move in with a sense of priority. The second point is, how do we increase the reach and range of our own digital capabilities? We have a limited talent pool. We have a limited budget. How do we unlock that experience, that capability that exists in our broader enterprise? Our suggestion was you identify those technology executives, those business technologists who have technology, usable technology skills, and you form and support and embrace the whole, the whole notion of fusion teams, those multidisciplinary teams which exist, and you build a digital foundation to underpin them so they become a valuable digital engine for your enterprise. And then finally, solving the digital talent problem directly, maybe there's a couple of things that we can do here. Maybe we can increase the risk of hiring some people from unconventional sources. And maybe we do that by simplifying the work or focusing on new areas or whatever it happens to be to make that work. So, when the board of directors, the promoter, the owner says, show me the digital dividends that we've been investing in for the last few years, we may not be able to say, here it is, it's here, it's on plan. But I think at least we can say we have a way of achieving it now. There is a way forward. So when we're waiting outside of the boardroom, we can at least tell a story about how the future is going to be better than the past. And that really is the story of digital. The future is bright. The future is uh, a really interesting place to be, and we're all heading towards it. I wish you every success with that journey into the future. And thank you so much for teaching me Bollywood dancing. My back will get better. Enjoy the last day of symposium. Thank you for your kind attention. But nothing they could buy me made my heart whole. I'd given up on romance, then I found you. Ain't it